Welcome. This is the January 16th, 2024 Jail and Zones production user call. We have Doug, Jan, Mohammed, Dan, Antrenig, and myself, Michael. Uh, some A quick housekeeping note, the Zoom meeting appears to have fallen out of my Zoom account. I have no history of it, so I may have to issue a new one to keep these going with the scheduling. Uh, Doug, it sounds like you have some news on the OCI working group. Yeah, small small news. So as some people on this call know, we um, have been trying to start a working group to define the... Um, a free BSD extension to the OCI runtime spec. And this is something which is necessary to make sure that different um, runtime implementations can um, interoperate. It's basically defining the interface. Um, so the to give us a place to uh, record our discussions and the history of how we're making our decisions, we're creating um, a GitHub repo underneath the Open Containers organization. And this is basically seems to be their standard practice for how to track working groups and give and give them space to work. Um, so it'll be a GitHub repo. Um, it'll be owned by the people listed in the original PR as owners of the working group. Um, but all participants are welcome. Um, we can use the GitHub issues, discussions, Pull, um, pull requests in just the normal way to um, basically do our work, describe the the extension that we want for FreeBSD, and um, when we're done, that will get merged into the spec. But this is this is the next step for us. Um, so I've made a, an issue in the Open Containers slash TOB uh, repository, which is the um, Technical Oversight Board, that's the governing policy, governing system behind all these working groups. That issue is to create the new repo. Um, there's some typos in the template. They want to fix them first before stamping the, temp the existing template onto the new repo. It'll happen soon, I think. Excellent. Do you have a link for that yet, or is that simply a decision to be acted on? I don't have a link to the new repo because it doesn't exist yet. If you go to the open uh, github.com slash open containers slash TOB, there is an open issue for creating the new repo. And you can obviously observe that. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. <clears throat> uh, welcome, Daniel and Dave. Do you have any topics and news? And welcome, Jamie. Welcome, Jamie. Oh, excellent. Jamie, do you have any news to share? No, I don't. And just uh, just caught the very tail end of this request, though. And uh, yes, uh, definitely would like to, uh, when that GitHub repository gets up, take a look and see how that fits into uh, what we can already do. It sounds like what I really need for the open container stuff, though, is to get those jail descriptors working where you can really then work with the jail. But yeah, need, I would need to uh, see the details of what's being asked for. Hopefully it's something that can be done easily enough. Excellent. Uh, it sounds like uh, Antrenig, you have a thought on OCI trace. Yes, sir. Um, I discussed about this um, last week, and I've been doing some experimentation. Um, we're, we're using something similar in our company since we do honeypots, so we trace everything. Uh, well, we trace everything in the jail in this case. And I thought that, hey, this facility that we created is cool to also do debugging overall. And it looks like the um, OCI spec, the generic one as well, doesn't have a tracing uh, I think it's called a namespace, right? Uh, a tracing namespace. Uh, maybe a pl the free BSD one could can be a good playground since we have you know very good D-trace support and uh, play some things there, see what we can end up with, and maybe make it even more generic to bring it back into the generic OCI spec for every operating system. I'm sure everyone will have their own tracing facilities as well. So um, 
I, th I think that would be a very cool feature now that eBPF is way more uh, stable and functional on Linux as well. So that, that might be a good point. And then, then again, like things like breakpoints in application layers, uh, they don't care if it's Dtrace or eBPF or SysTap or whatever. So uh, even on that application layer tracing uh, hooks could be very generic regardless of the tooling, I guess. Uh, so th that that was also one, one of my ideas. Um, yeah, just just throwing it out there because uh, since we're playing with the standard, it might be a good play to, you know, play as much as possible <laughs> to get the most. I think it's a neat idea. Yeah. Imagine having cross Unix um, standards. Yeah, maybe maybe you could give it a name like POSIX. <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> Other observations on that? Um. Yeah. Sorry. I I, I do have a, a question though, because I I got kind Please. of confused when I was thinking about this. So, um, what about describing a jail whose root FS is Linux? How how is that going to end up being? Oh, oh, you know what I mean? Okay. Describe like, in what regard? So. Uh, in the spec, obviously, you describe how a, a container is supposed to start, stop, what to do at the creation, the network stack, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I'm I'm sure that if we create the spec, obviously we're thinking about FreeBSD on FreeBSD. But some operating systems like Illumos and FreeBSD can also run Linux containers. Um, so the way that we've done this before. Uh, or until now, rather, is um, we we take the um, we we take a, a container that's built with the OCI standard and we convert them into what we can run, right? So that that's been the overall idea for now. But is there even a place to play around with um, Unix on Unix emulation, like to um, say like, oh, this is a FreeBSD, but it can run on well, no one runs FreeBSD. This is Linux, but can run on Illumos, etc. Sorry, go on. Uh, I had a, a little context on this, but somebody else wanted to speak, so go ahead. So if you have Linux specific things, you have a, the Linux top level uh, sub object in your JSON configuration. So, where you can define things like UID mappings, namespaces, and so on. Uh, so the runtime spec already says it, and I think there's also a kind of uh, an ABI type or a platform type in the image specification. So there is a marker telling you what to expect. And one of the things we need is at the bare minimum to get FreeBSD supported is to have a reserved value to put there for FreeBSD. So this is this is already so, supported. I mean, so the uh, image spec uses Go as yep. its reference for for naming platforms and um, architectures. So we use That's, that. Uh, Our FreeBSD problem. images have OS, its OS field set to FreeBSD in lowercase. So uh, there's a problem here that they use uh, too short of a tuple. At least it used to be with Go and Rust. And so that if you have ABI incompatibilities yeah. going forward, so the, if, the just full, because the... it's FreeBSD 12, yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean it's FreeBSD 14. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, at the ABI level, because of the larger inode sizes this, and so on. This is actually this is covered in um, in the image format. Um, so, so they are not okay. Using let me the... let me let me finish. So, there's an OS field which is just FreeBSD. There's um, an architecture field, um, which say could be ARM sixty four. There's also a, a variant which is used somewhat in the ARM space to describe different ISAs. Um, there's a version field which is used on Windows to um, specify the operating system ABI. Um, that's supported by ContainerD, but not by Podman. But we could potentially, I've thought about this, we could potentially use that to say, this is um, a FreeBSD 14 ABI image. And then um, the um, you can make a, a multi 
arch architecture um, image. Michael. Yeah, my <clears throat> so my uh, connection's been a little flaky all day with the storms. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the crazy photos. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I don't, hopefully the, the recording didn't lose much of what I was saying. So basically, we can we can describe a lot of these things in the in the image already. Um, I would kind of like to to get PubMan to support the version field, which it doesn't right now, mostly because they don't support Windows, which is the one that is currently using that. But does that answer? I don't so think you had a question, but I just cover this. Thank you, Dirk. That answers my question. So mm -hmm. first of all, they did extend the fixed free tuple to a four or more tuple, and I just thought of it, it wouldn't even be a problem because uh, it's the executables inside of it which mm -hmm. have to be tagged uh, for the kernel to uh, run it with the right ABI version, and yeah. that's either done or not, so the image runs or not, it's not like you have to track yeah. that in the image registry. So that, that's correct. And in terms so of running Linux, running Linux images on FreeBSD, um, I have added some support for this in Podman, which basically looks at the image OS. And if it's if it's Linux rather than FreeBSD, it goes in and adds the required extra mounts into the into the um, container. Um, description because we need sysfs, we need the Linux procfs, so we need we need to a fake dev shum, um, we need probably um, probably other things that I can't remember. So it need, we need to add in a few extra mounts to make the Linux um, binaries happy. Um, with that, it works pretty well. Um, I don't think I would want to use it in production because without actually getting support for whatever workload you're running, say, hey, we're going to use your Linux thing under emulation on FreeBSD. Um, but yeah, it works. And I think I'm certainly not the first person to do this. I remember the FreeBSD port of Docker doing this 10 years ago, nearly. Um, and ContainerD supported it for more than a year, I think. And then, Jan, you followed up with, do Linux OCI images specify the minimum kernel version? And do you mean that in relationship to, say, FreeBSD Linux emulation? I haven't seen this. I haven't seen uh, the, the Linux the OCI images have a, a kernel version. Uh, they because certainly, well, Podman doesn't even doesn't support the version field, and that's the logical place where it, where it would go, I guess. I'm asking because the uh, FreeBSD uh, Linux ABI implementation yeah. roughly tracks its progress in Linux yeah. kernel version. It's yeah. reasonably compatible with, mm -hmm. let's say it like that. And so it would be, in my opinion, a good way to basically track what you would expect to work. Mm. So yeah, I don't, says, I don't know. What, I don't know how people do this. Something thirteen or so. We are mm -hmm. probably not compatible. If someone went through the effort to document that you can't use an older, long-term stable support kernel. I think this is, in my head, this is kind of, sort of up to the image author that to uh, be clear about how compatible their image is. If they're using some bleeding edge feature that's only available on. Uh, I don't know, Linux 7, which probably doesn't exist yet, um, then they need to make that clear on the image um, that, you know, this is this is bleeding edge stuff. And that if they want their image to be widely used, they, they should stick to ABIs which are widely supported. And this is going to be true across the Linux world, not just in FreeBSD emulation. Any other OCI questions or issues or ideas and such? Dave, you're wiggling away. Anything new and exciting in your neck of the woods? You are muted, perhaps. You are muted. 
sorry, that was for me. No, it was for Dave, but oh, um, no, uh, nothing, nothing new here. Just uh, my wife is messaging me. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Uh, Daniel, anything new and exciting? And for tomorrow's ZFS call, wow, he's been making progress on his Zelta replication tool. Stay tuned for that. I'm I'm loving it. Um, hey, y'all. I, I think the only thing um, the only thing interesting in terms of jails is is Michael had the idea. Michael Dexter um, had the idea of. Um, using using the ZFS written flag to um, uh, to you know sort of automatically keep track of where an instance is running. So I created a proof of concept with jails um, using my replication script, which is which is basically just awk that um, you know tracks the latest snapshots and so on. Um, but just by just by running it on on both systems, the you know it's only going to look for the latest snapshot. So I, I set up a proof of concept where I have four jails uh, running on one server. Of course, it doesn't have to be a jail; it could be a VM, could be anything, uh, and it's constantly syncing back and forth. So every x x minutes, um, you shut down the jail on one machine, you start the jail on the other machine, and start syncing the opposite way. Um, because, you know, it's, it's just, it's just keeping up to date with the, the latest snapshots and not giving any snapshots to anything that hasn't been written. So with very little discipline, you can have a, a two way sort of asynchronous kind of, um, uh, clustering setup that's also, you know, really safe and, you know, doesn't require the same kind of overhead that, uh, clustering file system might. So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting approach and it's it's really good for approaches to to fleets like mine which is which is eighty percent um, you know eighty percent jails and then there's always the struggle of okay well it's time to upgrade the hosts and I've got to move all of the jails over um, so having that as part of the natural ecosystem where the jails are in two places at all times, always on their partner server, um, and, and you know, on a on a nearly re real time basis. And simply the process of shutting it down, checking the snapshots, and then starting it on the opposite server is what causes that to be the primary. Um, and and then the snapshot uh, tool is just going to check for that written flag. So once it's moved, it's moved. You don't have to you don't have to worry about that. So, you know, it, 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 it was an easy, easy proof of concept. And um, the, the next step would be just to decide on a jail management framework or to extend jail comp to, um, uh, you know, to, to make sure it's disciplined about, uh, you know, say, unmounting the jail when it's not in use or, or something like that. But it was I, I just I just liked it because it's it's such a simple it's just a simple thing but creates a very complex uh you know result where you know the server could explode and it's 10 minutes behind on another machine ready to be booted. Um which of course is the promise of ZFS and jails. It's just implementing the right kind of management scripts on top of that uh uh does some you know, does some magic. Nicely put. I'm happy to discuss it, but if others have questions, it's probably best you just naively I would love go at for it. The, I would love for this to be part of a tool that is not a jail manager. If you put right, it in a jail manager, it's specific to that jail manager. Right. I think Amen. I agree. I, I'm trying to use as much. So the, the only thing that, that the thing is the parts of the, the parts of the tool would, I really do think that it would be better if, if, you know, the jail not in use would unmount. And then of course there's the network handling and there's no network handling and Mac address handling built into jail com. All those are extensions as, uh... as far as I know, unless I'm wrong about that. Um, 
So there does kind of need to be, you know, a, well, at least at least some glue attached to jail comp, if not full blown jailer or something. Um, so, Anshnik, what do you have? Um, so I was thinking actually about this because, um, as as much as I love you know jailer and I use it daily, I I also agree that in many many cases you need only a subset of the features that jail managers have. And um, I was thinking if anyone would think uh, an internal API to jail to a jail manager would be uh, interesting or not. A, a good example of this thing, you know, in jailer, you can do jailer create to create a jail with specific arguments. But what if there was like an internal uh, API, let's say jailer underscore um, create only config, for example, and it would not do the whole thing, but just print the config file or just add hooks inside, uh, uh, what do you call that, inside uh, 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 exec pre-start or something like that. So like, so like you can use jailer as a full-blown jail manager or, use a, or you can use it as a hooks generator, kind of. Um, I, I, I don't know if that even makes sense. Because, uh, so, I mean, yeah, sorry, go on. What you propose is already possible through the mechanisms. What's missing is the agreement to have something other than a mechanism. So what we are lacking is basically an opinionated, easier to use syntax to do it or um, specific support for a specific implementation of this because what you can already do is from every hook where you can run arbitrary shell code from j.conf you can put in a shell script to search for executables in a directory similar to what uh, a dhcp client commonly does and run them all in sequence or something and um, so you can already have basically a directory containing your prepare pre-start and so on hooks, except for the hooks running inside the jail there, yeah, okay, you have to agree where you, it belongs in the jail, but otherwise it's only a pure host question and all of the file system and network uh, provisioning should, in my opinion, be handled on the host uh, or the parent, not inside the individual jail. Right, yeah, I, I, think I, it's, I, I think it's standardization, right? That's what, yeah. that's That's the only thing that's missing. Like and what's the what's the convenient. documented, yeah, the documented it's not handbook just that, way to... that that there is no uh, standardization. It's also that you have to use the universal shell scripting support to do it, even if it's a one liner. You still have to write it. So, if for example there was agreement that um, if that if something, let's say, the, yeah, the problem is that the hooks are defined as um, shell code directly and not paths to shell scripts. So uh, mm -hmm. here, the, the, if we had the agreement that there would be a new, let's say, exec file or, or exec dir, and if you do uh, put in an exec file, then it take the file, if you do put in an exec dir, it run, executes uh, in lexical order all scripts in that, or even sorts them you if uh, uh, with RC order or something. Yes. Because we already have RC order in base, so why not reuse it? Uh, yeah, yeah, Jan, so while I, I agree with you that yes, for example, jailed ZFS datasets, we currently use them with something like pre-start, right? Sorry, yeah, or like start or whatever it is, or created, or for example. created to move created, them away, right? yeah. But we can move them away to another uh, variable. The, my, my problem, and which is also common with all of my customers, is that if we add a feature like that today, uh, okay. I will still need to wait a whole year to to be able to use that feature, right? The, the That's how it is. I know, I know. The, the benefit of having a, um, uh, a something like Jailer or MacJail or any other thing is that uh, while while we all can work together to push such features 
inside of base, we can have them outside of base while it's still being developed. Or even, you know, to play around with multiple competing ideas until mm. uh, we figure out what is the best one. If, if that, so, so that that is the actual problem is like, okay, let's say I do spend some time and work on GL.C and add some features, but I, I there's no way for me to use it with my customers. Obviously, very, very, very small amount of people run current on mm. uh, production. And even if you uh, upstream it as PRs, it will get stuck in review. So um, <laughs> the next problem here is, but there's nothing uh, technically or legally preventing you from taking the jail command and uh, providing it as a port uh, with your extra features added. So keep basically package your own branch as um, as a port <clears throat> and thereby that it would be easy to consume because it would be only one package install array and um, it could even install under the same name so on, you only have to make sure that it's first in the search order. Uh, Jamie, has that ever been done? Do you know? I was going to say that. it's uh, We've done that. Okay. It right. has been done, I think. Uh, I'm not sure, certain it would have to be in the eight or nine days or something. But yes, uh, such hmm. things have existed. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and you can also you can also just change a single variable in our CCOM, which is jail command equals, and now you have a whole new you know user local bean jail instead of yes, you know, but that. Exactly, yeah. but that only works for the server script. It doesn't work for, or for the rc.d mm. script. It doesn't work for interactive use on the command line. Okay, for interactive use, you could use an alias in your shell. I know, I know. There are okay. always workarounds. Yeah. But, 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 but overall, um, that's yeah. like as, as much as I love the idea of having a contract and having all of these upstreamed, inside of the jail command, um, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to have jail devil package up, up there but in a port, which only The constraint compiles, on that yeah. package would be the, or on that port would be that it has to work with a release kernel. So that can't yes. change the ABI. So for example, storing a state inside the kernel per jail is not possible or using the hopefully not too far off gel descriptor or something. That's not something we you can do with a port unless you also write your own kernel module or something. Um, but just adding a new feature to the user land part of it, for example, exporting uh, jail variables to the environment of the hook scripts to be executed that would be possible without having to basically fork the whole FreeBSD repository and tell someone to build from your Git repository or something. That's a good question. Jamie, when was the last time we had an API change that affected jails? Do you have any, uh, uh, do, do, you, do you recall when something like that ever happened? Just uh, back in 09 or whenever it was when, uh, the, the modern jails were born. There's been API, you know, additions with new parameters put in, but you know, no actual API change. That you know, it was meant the uh, the whole name value thing of the jail set API was meant to not need changes to the interface itself. An octal gains fields until it stops being an I octal. My students tell me that oh, ioctals are basically a post request for the kernel. <laughs> Other design ideas there. It sounds like we need jail descriptors. Jamie, are there? I don't know, high end caffeine products we can send your way or anything to help? Ah, uh, no, just trying to clear out other need to do things. Okay. Just need. I just need to put it on my plate. That's all. 
when we send plates. <laughs> uh, Daniel, that sure seg segued. Um, gosh, so it's largely a ZFS question. We can talk about that outside of this, but yes, it definitely has value to jails. And yes, Dan, I see, uh, Dan L, I see how keeping these things as generic as possible, especially in an environment where we have lots of ZFS is certainly in our favor. And to your point, Antrenig, on you know doing one little step, the single greatest thing I did with VMRC was to generate the the VM launch script and nothing else. And you can just say, here's the dry run, have a nice day and take it from there and modify it and throw away VMRC. So yeah, all these little components are invaluable and having people aware of them rather than creating all these unique jail management ecosystems and they're not compatible is not long-term helpful. And that's how we actually got here. So uh, other topics, questions before we jump into Jan's uh Feature idea up. Uh, Ararat, do you have, uh, do you want to do an introduction or are you just a fly on the wall? Not to pick on you. And is that a colleague of yours, Antrenig? Uh, yes, Ararat is my mentee at the Armenian Bioinformatics Institute. Cool, oh, welcome. Our new new junior sysadmin. Oh, Today welcome. we played with Zvols and the Beehive and you know massive beehive deployments there and uh yeah so we are we're 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 solving um hopefully some uh, high performance uh scientific issues cool anything else before and we jump into a feature request from jan or idea rather jan let her rip uh you have an idea what is that so if you want to tweet basically the jails as images and opaque basically blobs to run on a host. You don't want to have to learn the internals of your supposed black box because then it stops being a black box from an operations point of view. You, you don't just push one of five buttons. You have to know which solar bridge to close <laughs> to change yep. your system. So instead... um. And I would like to see as a way to, with, via jail.conf, define uh, um, entry points basically into the jail. The canonical would be something like uh, open a root shell, so what JXEC does by default. But um, there should be other ones. The most useful one, I think, would be something like do initial provisioning. Um, which requires interaction. So for example, set an initial password on the service you want to run inside your jail uh, or even everyday commands like add a new user to your web service or something so, so that you can e have an easy to use interface where you would say like, something like, I don't know the what uh, flags for JXIC are still available, but that you could just tell it, I want to run this hook uh, with just that for the the parent or for the jail. And then you say the name of the jail, uh, the list of arguments as the rest of a command line, just like with JXEC normally. And JXEC takes care of giving you a clean environment to run the command in. What would be different from currently the way we run JXEC? Uh, currently, you have to know the exact implementation details. You do not have the uh, the layer of indirection of saying, I want to run the simple to use set admin password uh, hook or something. You have to do jxec this service specific admin command, let's say, cross a DCTL or something, or um, some OCC.php or whatever, depending on which service you're running. So you have to learn all the implementation details and are always exposed to them. And by the, that, do you mean make it uh, uh, FreeBSD and say Compat Linux agnostic? Um, when you say don't know the implementation, you mean... To, that's an orthogonal question. Oh, okay. It shouldn't be a problem here. Because hmm. uh, on the host, you always run the host ABI on the... Yes, you run whatever everything else inside the 
the um, jail is running from an ABI perspective because the ELF executables are branded. Okay, but if you want to set a user, do you want a generic syntax for any type of of jail, regardless of its ABI? Even um, I just want to understand it. The ABI is irrelevant. At this. It's not an obstacle as far as okay. I can see. Okay, cool. So what is the uh, obstacle? The obstacle is getting agreeing on the syntax and then implementing it and upstreaming the results so that it becomes... Exactly. So, for example, an initial hook, which is not related to starting or stopping the jail, but to either setting it up, reserving capacity for it, or without starting it. For example, making sure I can get a ZFS reservation for this service so that I can have a 100 gigabyte database on my server and I have a file system reservation for that med uh, storage um, or whatever else resource you need, reserving so the IP address, that, but not what? starting the jail with it. Just okay. making sure I will not run out of my DHCP pool or whatever else you're using to hand out IP addresses. Register the name, but don't start anything on it. Um, add or lock or remove a user hmm. on the service running, not just a jail user inside of a jail, but a service user on the service the jail is supposed to expose. If, if I may, if yes. I may, Jan, just to make your communication simpler. So now you can do um, PostgreSQL, initDB, dash D, var, DB, PG, data, Etc. 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 Or yes. you can do service PostgreSQL init DB, and then the init DB script will do everything for you, right? So that's the methodology. Yeah, yeah. You can you can and... exec into a jail, uh, create a Postgres user or Postgres might be a very bad example. So you can create a, a next cloud admin, set the password to yeah. return the password, etc. Exactly. Or you can do jail custom hook, set admin password, and you're done. So just to have yeah. like custom hooks to communicate with jails, uh, where yes. someone would define the hook and you would just use it. Sorry, go on. Yes, and why it is re uh, a pain point for me now is because with the new include syntax, I can do everything else. But And I could write my own run hook command or something, but where do I start store the hooks? Do I put them as files in the file system? So it would be a, basically a, a third party mechanism which wouldn't be integrated. And it would be the only part which wouldn't be integrated. That's why I would like to see it go into the jail command and its configuration file format so that anything which uses jail.conf can agree on this mechanism as a as an interface between, for example, provisioning tools like Jailer and the user, or another piece of, piece of code. And yeah, it would basically be the, the these are the exposed API endpoint then. Uh, are you at a point where you can make sort of uh, dummy configs to show what this might look like in practice? Yes, but oh. not during the call. Because That's fine. Yeah, just to yeah, for next time, just, you know, say, yeah. okay, here's here's what we have. Here's what a picture. And mm -hmm. I totally get the idea that if you kick off in you know, Antrenik's example, a Nextcloud instance, and all it does is say, here's the password we generated because that's a flashback to FreeNAS, TrueNAS. And perhaps that was handled by... IO cage, but yeah, I, I hear you. Exactly. Jail managers, some some jail managers have a mechanism similar to that, but each one has its own. And they're often as if I remember correctly, limited to basically provisioning and not to modifying running systems. Good point. Even if they technically could, it's just that there is no way to invoke this code path, which once you could invoke, it would probably work. We have to think about really, should there be some 
guardrails so that you can tag a hook as you can only do this once the jail is started. You can only do that when it's not started. Um, these kind of things. And yeah, I ran into it a few hours ago. So it's not like I had the time to- <laughs> Breaking read. news, cool. Yeah. Optionic, what you got? And feel free to jump in when you have, hear a pause. This is your call um, more than I, anyone else's. I, I have also a feature request, but uh, Jamie, you tell me if it's doable or not. Uh, Bring it on. It's useful or not. I need it, but I don't know if anyone else has. I would like the dash E flag to also print the uh, variables, not just the uh, keys. So, you know, someone can define a dollar sign ID equals full was inside the jail and then you or the path or whatever it is. Uh, but the dash E only prints the output of the things that the jail commands under, no, not the jail command, that the jail understands. So, you know, pre exec pre-start, stop, path, etc. But it will never print the uh, the custom variables such as dollar $ID. Um, I would also love to hack on this myself, but I just don't know if it's useful or, and also if uh, someone would like to have uh, uh, you know, any, anything else but this. And Jan said, oh, and jail-e doesn't allow restricting the output per jail. That is correct. Yes, it, it parses the whole file. That, 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 that also sounds like an on-topic uh, feature as well. You know, so be like jail-e-f and and give it a jail name to, to I, I think I have enough C knowledge to hack on this myself. I just don't know if it's um, feasible or not. So, uh, the problem with jail it, it, it's, it's a use case for me. Yes. Is I don't know its use case. I didn't put it in there. It just kind of appeared there one day. I don't even remember who did put it in. So I'm <clears throat> hesitant to change anything there lest I change what it's useful for, whatever that might be. Uh, right. So, so uh, uh, I'll show my simplest use case. Um, uh, as as a jail vendor, you know, uh, I mean, most of them have their own config files, but I don't. I only generate a jail conf and put it inside the directory. Um, so let's say someone did um, a jail rename, for example. They wanted to rename a jail. Now, sometimes that means only the jail name has changed, but sometimes it also means that they want to rename the path as well. So if you create a jail foo, now you're renaming it to bar. Maybe the path was slash jail slash foo. Now you want it to be slash jail slash bar, or you might not because you can keep the path as is. Um, it depends on, on, on the user's use case. But in either cases, if I want to uh, generate a new file, I just use the, um, the jail dash E to get all of the things that I have set up before get them in with the with the with the output of dash e and then and then uh, just you know regenerate again basically regenerate again resurrect yeah. them <laughs> sounds cooler <laughs> so yeah that, that that that's that, that's that's our biggest use case is to reparse to to parse things that we've already generated before um if if that makes sense um, we've had good success with, with that. Another one that we've used, the dash E, is also for, um, uh, you know, some kind of statistics uh, where you have a system with like hundreds of jails, not something that we've had good luck with, is we want to check, okay, how many of these are using DHCP and how many are not? And we usually have DH client inside the um, exec start, for example. So what we do there is, um, you know, we, 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 we use the dash E, get the outputs, filter out exec, exec start, and then we, uh, we you know, grab out of it how many DHCPs we have. So stuff like that, basically, it's, it's been very useful for us. And how about adding dash E that prints the parsed configuration as JSON? That also sounds useful. There's libexo in GL anyway. I think I personally can hack on that as well. Yeah, that makes sense to, uh, to add the libexo and E to make sure they work together. Yeah. Yeah, Antonig, you clearly need more projects. Clearly, clearly, clearly. As if, as if, I mean, last week was successful. <laughs> it was you a great threw, week, yes, I get that. You, you <laughs> threw five things at me, I've done three of them. If you gave me a single thing, I would have pro pro procrastinated. So there you go. There you go, okay. 
Uh, so we can always bury you with scriptures. rock. Um, was that you Jamie? Haven't given me enough things to do. You haven't given me enough things to do with jail descriptions. You just well, give apparently me one five phone. is a secret. Come on, like, yes. you know, one of them and nothing happens. So, uh, yeah, uh, Jan, I can't keep up with your chat, so just drop it in the dock. And that goes for whoever else has something clever because I can't totally multitask. My head might explode. Uh, but does that all make sense? Uh, but And I totally get that even if you have a dashboard, you just want columns like, here are all the DHCP ones, here's whatever, and uh-oh, we need to, you know, I'd impotently make these go where we want them to go, with be it the renaming or otherwise. Very nice. Anything else on that? Okay, anything else on anything else? Uh, Collabora is good. Oh, more do more tell. So more... that's jailable. Have you tried jailing it to bring it? Yes. As an excuse for on topic. Yes, tell us. It's 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 so. Whoever's wondering, there's this uh, software suite called called Collabora, which is a continuation of LibreOffice Online, which is a continuation of LibreOffice, which is a continuation of OpenOffice, which is you know, the, I don't want to get into there. Of Star Office, yes. So, I mean, the, the chain, of, <laughs> it's on, the chain yes. is too long. But the long story short version is that I tried using the Linux version with the Linux jail. It didn't work. Uh, whoever was on call last week, I gave the implementation issue, which was abstract sockets. And by the way, I've already, I, I have already implemented abstract sockets inside the Linux compat layer. I just oh, did you? Yes, okay. I I just need to test it a little bit more and hopefully send a uh, a review. Was that based um, on the Illumos code? Yes. From Patrick, was the license fine? Uh, uh, I didn't copy the code, you know, as in copy pasta. I just Good. took the idea. Cool. Uh, um, the, uh, that was the the beginning. The continuation is I was like too angry with it, and I'm like, no, I'm just going to port this to FreeBSD. Turns out there was already a port in progress that never made N because it was half-baked and very complicated and the Collabora was not built anything for other than Linux. The Collabora team has done some good work last year to make it with less, less Linuxism, I would say, if you build it yourself. And now I'm able to compile, build, and run Collabora on FreeBSD. Um, the only problem is that because Linux doesn't have jails, They've created fake jails for Collabora. Ah, okay. uh, it's, it's basically a cheroot, uh, but it, it doesn't understand FreeBSD, basically. So um, I'm going to have a talk with them on Thursday to either add if defs in, their, in that command that would either um, copy the cheroot of FreeBSD uh, minimum requirements, or if they agree, would just hit me. How about just use libjail and create an actual jail? You know, just like Pudria does. Um, the the code base is not that complicated. It's like thousand line of C plus plus code, uh, which equals to a masochism. But that's a story for another day. Um, so yeah, that that's the overall story of Collabora. But you know, if if you don't use the jailing mechanism, um, it runs all fine without any issues. Michael's been using it in his house for playing around. I've used it finally. I was also to replicate the same for all production versions. So 15, 14, 13.2. Oh, you got 13 um, yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, I, I stayed okay. up. I stayed up till 10 a.m., but oh, I dear. wanted to fix oh. that. <laughs> oh my, oh my. Okay, great work. Um, and to state the obvious, I don't want to be typing on a Google Doc for an open source meeting meeting. So uh, <laughs> it is very exciting. I am beside myself. I have colleagues with hundreds of users ready to use it like yesterday. Go ahead, Jan, you made a noise. So, uh, Antrenek, do you happen to know why they decided to use abstract sockets? Uh... No. I ha I'll i ask in, the, in their Thursday meeting. I, I have no because, idea why. Um, abstract sockets, uh, for those who don't know about this Linux isms, um, use Unix sockets, but instead of a file in the file system namespace, the path starts is empty, or you can say the name starts with a null byte, and then you have an abstract second flat namespace. And so you don't have to go through the file system. So it could be any permission issues. You have to be very careful with um, abstract sockets because they can be targeted by any user. There is no access control. 
Um, so you can you have you have to accept the connection and then um, look up or have the kernel tell you um, the effective ID of the other side. If you want to do uh, access control using Unix uh, user ID and group ID or something like that, so it's a hack. Um, and the question, but for their use case, I'm really wondering what need they had. Could they use it to uh, cross namespaces or something? I I, I actually uh, I looked into the git blame and the commits. I couldn't figure out. The only thing I could figure out is Linux abstract sockets exist because they don't have socket pair like FreeBSD and doors like Solaris. So, so that, uh, that the other thing is how you could you kind of fake a very similar mechanism completely in user space. It's a hack. I tried it to get around having to have a writable file system. And that is, you can do the following. You create a socket pair. You use uh, the Capsicum system calls to restrict one side to only run uh, receive message on it. And then the other side is used to inject uh, one side of new socket pairs. So you kind of implement the multiplexing done by connect and accept uh, in user space. And you have to um, know the implementation details because the instead of um, a um, instead of a backlog setting, you kind of have to set the backlog setting through the uh, socket buffer size of the initial socket because you can instead of a backlog you can control um, how many pre-created uh, socket pair halves are uh, enqueued in the send queue which does work it's just not mm, something I assume the original implementers ever thought about but this way you can use this socket pair system call, which does not require a writable file system at all um, to multiplex um, Unix sockets. So you could have, for example, if you have an alternative init process, which happens to start as init, so before the root file system is writable, then it can use this mechanism to start a helper to load its configuration and start applying it before there is a writable file system to bind a socket to. Uh, the alternative, which is less painful, is to mount a tempfs into a well-known path yes. and use that to or just mount your um, socket. But yeah, so when you uh, try to really upstream your abstract socket namespace implementation, Please make it available for FreeBSD as well, because especially if you want to use it across jail boundaries, it's useful for a FreeBSD host to talk to a Linux uh, service bound to an abstract socket. And the other part, yeah. think about my, also my 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 implementation and, uh, of the uh, and jail sorry. boundaries. So there should probably be. Uh, Similar to the system five IPC uh, inherit behavior, there should probably be a setting to control if you inherit your parents' uh, abstract namespace or get a new one. I don't see any way to do an embedding so that you do it under a prefix or something for the abstract namespace because there wouldn't be enough space in the fixed size struct to put both a jail name or ID and a mm. maximum length abstract name. So I don't see how you could do that. And, um, but just, just because I copied the Lumos model, I just basically convert an abstract socket to regular socket inside TempFS. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's, that, that sounded really... the easiest way. Okay, so you map it to a tempfs and 
just set the temp fs to what uh, all seven 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 so anyone no, can no, no. come by the, and the opposite it it becomes the user it becomes the user of the process that is running it be, yeah it becomes the user of the process that is running it becomes with a dot uh, uh prefix so it becomes dot a b Wait, A B abstract S K A, a B S K. So, so for example, if 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 Collabora is using the cool string because that how that's how cool they are, it becomes a slash TMP a slash dot A B S K dot cool. It converts to that uh, with uh -huh. with the uh, with with the user of Collabora that's running in. So it becomes the cool user, for example, uh, with with all these permissions. Um, uh, by mm. by the way, I can only create them right now. <laughs> I, I can't make it to talk back and forth yet. So uh, I still have to go over that part of the code in um, Illumos as well and see how it works. Oh, sorry, Michael, absk.cool. Yes, dot, oh, there's also a dot. Um, in yes. Interesting. Uh, if you restrict your prefix for basically to a single byte, so a dot, for example, mm -hmm. uh, then you would have the advantage that you could do it in in place so you basically replace the null byte mm -hmm. With a dot. which is already allocated in the uh, socket address struct and then yes. you could use the buffer and you don't have to even worry about uh, that anymore you could basically um, map it to an open at because yes, you still have the problem that uh, sorry, open at uh, connect at connect that. that yes. although, 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 would it doesn't would it work make sense with... to have a, Would it make sense to have a directory then, like slash tmp dot absk directory, and then inside of it have dot cool? But the reason why why I added the absk is also the reason why Illumos has it is just to make sure that when a user or an operator sees that they're like, oh, okay, it, it comes from Linux. I would. Like, uh... Prefer it to not go into the normal slash temp because then it can collide. So you can't Both. just assume that there's there are no dot files with the same name because some software may even intentionally use the same name for a temp file and for its abstract socket. Because why use two names when these namespaces aren't supposed to overlap? Yes. So yeah, I don't think that's a hypothetical problem. So yeah, it may be okay. better to instead use a new uh, location. Uh, it could be a, under a directory in slash temp, which will then be a reserved name or something. Uh, or you could even go the extra step and make the prefix uh, changeable via a CCTL or something, which would have oh, a default that's... value, so that you could basically point. set that. And the assumption would be before the first abstract socket is created, um, you have to mount this temp FS. Mm, that, that, yeah, so, I, I or this file about that. system has to be writable before you can use it. Um, mm -hmm. And with temp FS, you can always have a writable file system as long as you have a few megabytes of memory. Course. The other problem is you um, have to think about what happens when there are different user IDs and which boundaries. Going through the file system namespace has, has the advantage that file systems are already initially from the beginning of time part of jails. So here maybe the just path rewriting is good enough. Uh, and then you could basically, if you want to jails to or the host and a jail to share the um, abstract socket namespace, you just set the path to a shared path. And if you want to expose the host's uh, abstract socket namespace, you null FS mount it into the jail. Which reminds me, uh, Jamie, did you find time to look at the bug reports for um, file, 
directory file descriptor passing over Unix sockets between jails? Oh, I haven't looked at that one since it first came out. I'm trying to think, is that the one that I decided was not really a bug report so much as a foot gun? No, it is a bug. Because, oh, okay. And the first fix proposed would nerf certain uh, features in jails. Yeah. Because the idea was, yeah, just don't allow file descriptor passing between across jail boundaries, which is something you really don't want to nerf. Right. Because then you kind of break the capability uh, model. But, and there are, in my opinion, valid use cases for passing file descriptors between jails or parent and jail. Oh, yes, the other way around. And for for example, uh you can right now you can um have a jail without an IP stack, but you can still pass in connected sockets, for example. So that you can have something like a CGI script running without network access and still going directly to a socket. Which Sounds strange, but it's possible and very useful and has no overhead. You can benchmark out because it's there is no extra copy involved. It's just that inside the networkless jail, you can't create a new socket. And so you can't do anything but use the existing file descriptor, which just happens to be a socket. And I mean, there was an attempt to prevent this kind of foot gun situation because uh, the uh, jail attached system call or jail uh, set property system call doesn't let you uh, enter a jail if you have an open directory file descriptor to outside the jail at least because that's an easy mistake to make uh, mm -hmm. for any user space process to not know if this process among other file descriptors contains a directory file descriptor. Um, so it's good that you can't do it by accident, but you can kind of cheat and trick the kernel by um, forking, then attaching, and then having your child uh, send you the descriptor you weren't allowed to take with you. Yes, and I don't see that as a cheat. I see that as yes, definitely. Yes, that's no, no. That, yeah. There are valid use cases for this, and yeah. I found the bug report not because I read all the bug reports, but because I encountered a problem when I tried to ex do exactly that, so that I could basically use the uh, support in the linker for taking the library directories as file descriptors, and then basically have an empty jail with an empty file system and still runtime link inside of that, which is possible through because the FreeBSD runtime linker can be configured via an environment variable to look up shared libraries uh, via uh, a set of file descriptors to directories. And you can also provide the image to be runtime linked as a file descriptor. So that means you can jexec into a empty jail and then become a process or the real use case I had, I wanted to have the option of not having to install administrative commands into a minimal jail so that I can have a single executable jail and still do things like IF config route and so on before 14 added most of the common use cases via the dash J flag to IF config and route. But still there are other commands which are not jail aware and can, can't jail themselves. So being able to jail an arbitrary command so that you're already in the jail by the time the linker is executed to run the command is still useful in my opinion. And you can even use interpreted scripts uh, as long as they don't include other scripts because you can have them read from the slash dev fd something to read from and to take the script from a file descriptor you also send it. It's a bit tricky to utilize, but it's possible. 
The problem is that if we disable all of this the sending file descriptors across, especially file descriptors to directories from outside the jail, you break this feature which right now exists but is insecure. It's not that much of a real world issue because root has to do the contortions to basically create intentionally create the exploitable situation. So it takes root from outside the jail to set this up. Which is why I see it as a footnote. But the bug report says it doesn't really, because if you have the more common use case, you have a shared tempfs for two jails to communicate via Unix sockets. Right? That's a common use case. Let's say you have one jail containing a load balancer and then several jails being the load balanced service and they share a tempfs of sockets. So that only the load balancer is bound to a TCP socket, let's say something like HA proxy, and all your um, fast CGI services you want to load balance across uh, are bound to Unix sockets so that you don't have to worry about exposing uh, unencrypted fast CGI traffic to the IP stack at all. Which is a production configuration for me. Um, but the problem is that using file descriptor passing one jail can send a file descriptor to a directory from inside it to the other jail and the jail root enforcement does not work anymore. Okay, that's right. And it gets out of both. So yeah. then okay. you can transverse as root of one jail with your root super user status into the parent file system, which is a game over. Okay, yes, I see. I think I might have been thinking of the wrong bug. Yes, that one. No, I. And that's that the problem me. because if you disable the, the, this, basically disarm this, yeah, it, it's a bug, but it requires triggering the foot gun to exploit the bug. Um, so, well, if, a, a workaround would be to the most aggressive fix for this would be to basically prohibit jails from passing file descriptors across jails at least, which yeah would break useful configurations. Yeah, that's uh, something we definitely want to be able to keep. The other one would be to have a nullfs mount flag added, which would disable this at least, so that you can't use it. But then you have to look up the state and associate it, which is also annoying and probably not much easier to do than doing the right thing. The question is, what is the right thing when you uh, have a file descriptor from outside a jail inside a jail for navigating the file system? Um, because as far as I could find out, the VFS uh, does not track this. And you don't want to add a pointer from each file opening to a jail. So, because then you have to track the lifetimes and do additional locking. So we really can't have a back pointer from each open file descriptor or file to a, a jail. Yeah, so that does seem like what is needed for this. That's no. That's yeah, that's the thing. It is a, this is a tricky problem because yeah, everything that we can do is a feature we want to allow, but we but, do need to have a way of plugging this. And, and I don't know. In my opinion, what I the semantics I would like to see are is if you have a file descriptor from outside of your jail root, then it implicitly sets the O beneath uh, option. So with um, open uh, add, where you use, which is how you would exploit this, um, and you also need it for change directory. So F C H D D R. There is this flag O resolve beneath, which uh, and this flag should be implicitly added to any 
operations relative to this path. So this enforcement is already there, and then you can only go deeper down the file system, and you can't in use the dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot, dot and so on to eventually uh, modify uh, the parent root uh, dot ssh of rest keys or something. Yeah, that that might uh, still keep it useful for any real it's purposes. Still useful for any non. Uh, malicious use case because I can't see a non-malicious use case where you want to enable someone to navigate out of the directory you pass to them because if you truly follow the idea that a file descriptor should be a um, capability then the directory file descriptor should be the capability to that dis directory and not all the directories containing it. I wonder if we could do a uh, variation of that, though. If mm -hmm. if you have some place that uh, you, know, you can't go above from that file descriptor, can we set that I guess the place you can't go above is tied to exactly what that directory is. Otherwise, it would be a two files. It would be exactly. Mind, yeah. Yeah. And that's, in my opinion, exactly the right semantics. You can't, you can't go upward. You can only go down downward, and that's the correct semantics across. Yeah, jails, yeah, that sounds like a workable solution. And then you don't even have to do that because, unless you worry about. It may be enough then instead of having a full pointer to just track the jail IDs. So that if the file would ha have a jail ID and if the jail ID is not equal to the thread performing the VFS operation, then all the credentials passed in there. So the UCRED struct, you compare that to the the, that UCRED's jail ID to the jail ID of the file descriptor. Maybe we need a generation mechanism for jail uh, ID reuse, similar to how NFS uses stale file handle so that you have basically a two-part counter. Or we need a truly monotonic per jail counter let's say a 64-bit or larger jail ID counter internally, which would never be reused and not yeah. assignable. I know, I know that's a point pain point for you. Yeah, it's, it might be a useful thing in other cases, though. What? A, 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 basically a jail nonce. Yes. A jail nonce... Uh, or jail unique ID or something. Yeah. It would only have to be unique per kernel runtime. So yes. if you reboot, it's it's in feral. But having this kind of, if we had this kind of type and it's no longer than 64 bits, which is enough in my opinion for the uptime of a system because you can't, you don't even have a really a longer time counter in a lot of places. So after two to the power of 64, you run out of jail IDs or whatever kind of IDs it would be. But if it's not longer than a pointer on a 64-bit system, it makes it possible to do atomic uh, operations on all of them. Uh, FreeBSD will probably ever support because I don't see FreeBSD ever supporting an architecture which can't do an uh, atomic load store of a pointer-sized value. Mm. Yeah, and then then you we have a very cheap way to just compare for equality. But that's kind of requires someone with a really deep understanding of both jails and the VFS. Does such a person even exist? C can we? Uh, have a little transporter accident, Jamie, between you and Kirk or something? <laughs> yeah. 
There was a Voyager episode on that, wasn't it? <laughs> 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 One of the worst ones, if I remember correctly. But... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, because it's really a hairy problem to have. Yes. Because you can't afford to track lifetimes and have dangling back pointers. The locking overhead would really hurt in the critical path of the most common I.O. system calls. So, yeah, I... Uh, Yeah, I'd, I, there might be some way around that overhead, but I, I'd have to give that some thinking. And the only thing I can think of is we need a unique counter, which yeah. is not allowed to overflow uh, or be reset at runtime to yep. track, identify jails by. Um, and because right now the jail ID, I think it's 32-bit, not 64, right? It's 32-bit, and it's limited to a much tighter Sound. range of that. Well, the auto-allocation is, right? Manually assigned ones, I think, are not limited. Or I haven't found the code doing that. Mm, yeah, I think you might be right. I think it, it may be that you can't have negative jail IDs, I think. So it has to be a non... It has to be a... A larger than zero uh, 32 bit signed integer value or something is the constraint. By the at the data type level, because you, negative ones, I think which is the value you have to send for the next jail ID uh, to enumerate them? Zero, minus one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Minus one is an error code, definitely. So. Yeah, zero uh, the uh, the end of the list one, yeah. Yeah, zero or uh, maybe some other reserve value. Maybe you also reserve the maximum value. I don't know. I, I think I only reserve do... zero and minus one for any special meaning. Yeah. Yeah. With minus one being the error that you fail to create a jail at least. Yeah. So there's at least one place where you can't have minus one as jail ID, or you lose the ability to detect errors. Yeah, yeah, they have to be more than zero. That's that's a definite. Mm -hmm. Don't know if there's an upper limit, but they have to fit in the fixed size integer. Yeah. I think. Yeah, at least that. That might just be all. So, so you still two to the power of thirty-one minus one. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Sorry for dumping that on you. Oh, that's okay. But if we get that secure, uh, it would be a really neat feature to have a command to basically take any parent executable and link and run it in a jail. Mm -hmm. I wanted to implement that command and stop because I found out that if I do that, I create a jail escape uh, as a feature. Yeah, because I would have to to for it to be useful and work without mounting null fs's or copying things to a te to a temporary directory to temporarily create a place for file descriptors to be created inside the jail instead of passed into the jail. Then yeah, I can't use it. Um. As far as I know, regarding your updates on ePoll and IOU ring, there were no updates. Okay, I just saw the end there. Oh, right. So, uh, that, 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 or is uh, that from last week? That was from last week, but what happened? Oh, no, that was, was for week. today. That was uh, actually a good point. That was a template for today. Uh, Antrenig. So you do have, in yes. fact, no, you have an update on the 
abstract sockets, but anything there? No, no. I hope as as I go forward and learn more about the compact layer, uh, my goal will next be to implement the um, uh, EPOL stuff because we can use Docker containers at that point. Unfortunately, Docker containers that use Nginx use Nginx only with EPOL. They don't use select or any other polling, Unix polling options, which we don't support in the compat layer. So if, uh, if I, I think we more... do support EPOL, but oh. not but, the but... one flag Nginx required to... Exactly. Uh, and that's... What was it? One report only once or something, so that after each time yes. an event has been reported, you have to rearm the uh, ePoll registration. Yes, yes. So maybe I I will go into that later because um, again this is my first time in the kernel land, um, and if that goes well, um, we also have basic support for IOU ring. I, Big I what? Seeing in the What's basic the support. Basic. Oh, sorry. I, yeah. IO inside IO your ring. I would like to also complete more stuff there as we can use it for, you know, high performance computing, Linux containers and stuff like that. But very useful for scientists as far as I can tell. So there's that, you know. Um well, anything which basically has to avoid the expensive context switches. Yes. And in my opinion, FreeBSD could really use an IOU ring like system call or set of system calls, but it shouldn't be the IOU ring one because IOU ring is full of Linux isms and yes. half thought out designs. Maybe take a hard look at it if you, we really, if basically we can add what FreeBSG needs in a compatible way so that we remain at least API compatible or gain API compatibility. That would be nice to have for the basic use, but I'm afraid that this isn't really feasible with because you can't afford a lot of even just CPU overhead in this case. Um, and, and give it a name that you can remember and pronounce. I owe ring? <laughs> yeah. So I have it's trouble. An, it's IO and it's a user space to kernel space ring buffer. I think. Oh, of and course. It's a f <laughs> it could be worse. Okay, thank you. Even fair enough. Fair enough. It could be for worse. Example, That's e it. for something which replaces polling. Okay. Post poll. Anyway. Yeah. Anything else? Not really. Dan, is everything okay? Pretty much. From... Yay. Yeah, no big issues here. I had an epiphany. I can use those Asia BSD con desktop gift clocks for time zones, at least UTC plus local. Hmm. Anyway. Well, thank you, everyone. Talk to you perhaps tomorrow. And this was a lot of good discussion. I appreciate that. I'm going to call I'll it, try to and bring I can stick some, around a few minutes. Uh, Go ahead. A schema and some examples for it next week. For my Excellent. Presentation. All right. I look forward to that. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.